Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. President Trump gave his first State of the Union address, the first official one anyway, last night. You probably saw it. The striking thing about this speech was how normal it seemed, how ordinary it was. The president stuck to the script pretty much to the letter. The result was squarely in the center of American public opinion. You heard broad appeals to national unity, calls for strong borders, a robust military. You heard warm words for the country's bedrock institutions, from the family to our democratic process. Outside the faculty lounge, most Americans like these things. They agree with them. Donald Trump remains controversial as a person, but the bulk of his positions are not controversial, not very. Check the polling on that. And that may be the key thing to know about our current politics. It's mostly personal. If you read a Trump speech in a British accent, pretty much everybody would applaud. Not everybody, but most people. Well, maybe unfortunately for all of us, last night's State of the Union was not delivered in a British, British accent. Democrats did not applaud. In the modern Democratic Party, everything Donald Trump says is hate speech, even the things the left once agreed with. Yes, Trump has changed the Republican Party. A lot has been written about that. But not nearly as much as his administration has changed Democrats. If you just return from a year abroad, prepare yourself. You will not recognize the new Democratic Party. Last night, Democratic members refused to stand or clap when Trump praised the national anthem, when he praised military veterans, when he pointed out new low black unemployment numbers. Some refused to stand for Steve Scalise, the Louisiana congressman who was nearly murdered last year by a Bernie Sanders supporter. So what is going on here? Well, obviously they're giving Trump the finger. Bad manners are now a form of resistance. But what if it's more than that? What if Democrats actually don't like those things anymore? What if praising our veterans or our flag really does enrage the modern left? Well, in a tweet during the speech, MSNBC host Joy Reid put it this way, quote, church, family, police, military, the national anthem, Trump trying to call on all the tropes of 1950s era nationalism. The goal of this speech appears to be to force the normalization of Trump on the terms of the bygone era. Now think about that for a minute. Church, family, police, military, and love of country are now merely, quote, tropes from a bygone era? Most Americans consider those things the pillars of our civilization. And if you don't agree with that, imagine a society without those things. What would it look like? How long could it last? Would you want to live there? Joy Reid would. So would many of her co-anchors over at MSNBC and her Harvard classmates, and apparently most of the Democratic caucus on Capitol Hill. Church, family, police, military, those words disgust them. This isn't a political resistance. It's not about Donald Trump. It's nihilism, the mindless impulse to tear down what you did not build. It's rage at your father, translated into political terms, a politics that elevates all that is ugly and decadent and seeks to undermine the decent and the beautiful and all that came before. This isn't a philosophy. It's a sickness. And once you catch it, you're apt to say things like this. He gives a speech tonight in which he makes it sound like the biggest issue in the United States, uh, the biggest threat is MS-13, a gang nobody that doesn't watch Fox News has ever heard of. For this president to conflate the dreamers with gang members, he was demonizing our That's immigrants true. here, and I was offended. So MS-13 is merely something that Fox News created to demonize immigrants. Presumably those would be the very same immigrants that gang routinely kills because they only kill immigrants. We don't want to think the left really believes any of this, but we're starting to suspect they really do. Joe Concha writes about Media for the Hill, and he joins us tonight. So, Joe, um, over on another cable channel, one of the contributors said that she was, in effect, triggered by the word family in the speech. That was offensive. Maybe it was a dog whistle or a code word for something else. What did you, th that to me kind of crystallized the response. What was your view of it? The view overall was who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe polls that were taken by people, from people, from across the country by CBS and CNN? I get their flash polls. You can only hold them in so much weight. And maybe a couple more Republicans watched last night uh, that answered to this poll, but I don't think it skewed it that much. So you either believe them or you believe pundits that primarily do their pontificating from studios in New York and Washington and almost never venture out. And all I could think of was 2016 and the election in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania in Michigan and the fact that no one got anything close to getting those 
states right in terms of that blue wall coming down because no one can gauge the true pulse of the country. So we see the analysis today, Tucker, and last night, and then we compare it to polls that have just astounding numbers. As CNN uh, saw its respondents say the speech was very or somewhat positive. It goes higher on CBS, it goes to 75 percent. But here are two key stats. Eight in 10 in the CBS poll who watched felt that the president was trying to unite the country rather than divide it. Yet all we heard from pundits was that this was a gloomy and divisive speech. And finally, out of the CBS poll, put the partisans aside, those who identify as independents, 73 percent saw this speech as positive. But if you never heard about these polls and you watched the coverage today, you would think that this was one of the worst, most divisive, most darkest speeches, most darkest is a double negative, darkest speeches uh, that we have ever seen from a president. It's almost as if there's a disconnect between the public and the people who are supposed to be gathering its news and, and presenting reality to them. Well, yes. I mean, look at Joy Reid and her saying that uh, MS-13 is a Fox story. I think she got her F mixed up. It's an FBI story, as in they're on the FBI list. And it's not like this is just a gang that you could put together a football team with. There are 70,000 members in MS-13 in Long Island, not too far from me here in Jersey. Uh, they committed 25 murders, according to local authorities, since 2016. That's a big deal when you hear so, about that so, many but murders I wonder, I mean, if gang. you dig down a little bit, how many of those murders are people in your neighborhood or mine, let's see, zero. How many were of fellow Salvadoran, Guatemalan, Honduran immigrants? A hundred percent of them. So how is it anti-immigrant to oppose a gang that kills immigrants? Well, it, it kind of contradicts what the president said the week before, which was he extended uh, his DACA proposal to 1.8 million people. I mean, that, that is far more than the 800,000 that we have been hearing. So how can he propose something like that and be anti-immigrant at the same time? It's a walking contradiction, Tucker. So you've got to wonder, I mean, is there anyone who's in the, at these networks who's thinking through what life after Trump might look like? I mean, if you alienate oh half the country or devalue your credibility with all the country, because they have, wh what happens when he's gone? Oh, boy. <laughs> it's going to be a complete disaster, I would say. I mean, the only reason why ratings are uh, a little bit higher and, and being propelled is because of Donald Trump and obviously the right. vitriol towards him. And I think what's happening now, and I honestly believe this, that you have a lot of pundits, particularly Republican pundits that are anti-Trump, that are telling their audience on those networks what they want to hear. In essence, comfort food, because on their phones afterwards, they're checking Twitter. And if they are even remotely contradictory in terms of not being anti Trump. And we saw, saw this last year with Van Jones after the president's address to the joint session of Congress. He had praised the president, said he looked presidential, and he got bullied and destroyed on social media to the point where he had to go back on the air and say, wait a minute, let me clarify what I really said. So I think now at this point, you have anchors and pundits that are very, very afraid that their audiences will turn on them unless they right. say exactly what they want to hear. And it's Trump derangement syndrome as well, which, you know, obviously, if you suffer for that for more than four hours, go to a safe space immediately. Yeah, it's an airless room and Twitter makes it worse. Joe, thank you for that. Mm. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless America.